this place the anointing somebody say the anointing if you're online type it in the comments the anointing the anointing is in this place tonight today excuse me and I'm so blessed to be able to minister to you this morning and before I do I hope you all had a good time with your families yesterday and uh, how many had a good time with their families. It was the day of uh, Fort July is uh, Independence Day for the United States, but you know it's not my Independence Day. Now I'm not making a political statement, so don't get nervous. My Independence Day was not July 4, 1776. My Independence Day was. October 12th, 1993, when Jesus came into my life. And I want to tell you, man, I am so grateful. How many are grateful for your salvation? How many online are grateful for your salvation? I'm grateful for my salvation. And because the Lord has saved me, I want to continue to be faithful. So if you haven't had an opportunity to pay your tithes or give of your offerings uh, today, you can just go to the app or you can click the link below. If you're visiting us this morning, you can certainly do an offering today. I always believe that whenever you're uh, visiting somewhere, you should leave an offering in that place and uh, leave a seed. Victor Eric San Diego is good, good ground. Amen. And, uh, you know, we don't have to fundraise and we don't have to do all that kind of thing because we've taught our people the principle of kingdom giving. Amen. And because our people have caught the principle we continue to honor the Lord with our tithes and our offering. And we just continue to just do what the word says. Tell your neighbor, do what the word says. And when you do what the word says, you will be blessed. You will be blessed. So we've been able to reap those blessings um, and be able to experience the power of kingdom prosperity because we honor the Lord in the tithe. I mean, the tithe belongs to him. It's not ours anyways. He just asked for 10% but then also our offering. So tonight, today, I keep saying tonight, it's dark in here. It feels like night. Come on, somebody. Um, honor the Lord in your giving. You shall be blessed. Amen. Praise God. How many ready for the word? Woo. Praise the Lord. This morning, I'm going to ask you, uh, if you're tuning in or wherever you are today, open your Bible with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 45. And as you turn there, I want to wish a very special happy birthday to our brother and a very precious man to our church, Pastor Miller Oliver. And I don't normally, you know, uh, announce everybody's birthday or else I'd be making announcements every day. But I'm going to know Pastor Miller is very special to us. I may appreciate him and all his hard work that he puts in. And I want to give him a very special acknowledgement today in front of everybody because he turned the big 50. <laughs> and he doesn't look a day older than 33. He really doesn't. And uh, it's crazy with me and him that the older we get, the better looking we get. It's crazy with me and him. It's just like we look better. <laughs> but Miller, we honor you today. We thank God for you today. Come on, can we give honor where honor is due? And he's 50, so he's the first one to the, from my group here, my generation to 50. You know, uh, me and Regina are not far behind. T-Rock is not far behind. Chris is not far behind, but we shall get there. Praise the Lord. So we thank God for you, Miller. We pray you're blessed on your birthday. Amen. Do you have Isaiah chapter 45? I want you to look at verse 2 and 3. The Bible says, I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron, and this is where I think we should get a big shot. He says, I will give you the treasures out of darkness. 
and hidden riches in secret places that you may know that I, the Lord who called you by your name, am the God of Israel. I want you to look over at verse 11 of the same chapter. And the Bible says here, thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his maker. He said, ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands, you command me. I think you ought to underline that. Ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands that you command me. This morning, I have a message of direction. And I know the Holy Spirit, thank you, Matt. I know the Holy Spirit is moving very strongly today in the praise and worship. I think some of y'all came in with the attitude to give the devil a black eye and worship today. But I do feel the prompting to give a word of direction in this season. This is the very middle of the year. Some will say the second half is going to be the best half. And I've been asking the Lord for direction, just like many of you have been asking and I want to talk to you out of a message entitled, The Wave of the Future. The Wave of the Future. And the reason I shared this portion of scripture, especially in the first part, is because when times are uncertain, I'm, I'm grateful for the promises of God that not only he has on our life, but he has on our ministry. How we know our ministry is called by God chosen by God. I, I thank God for the promises he has upon our church, that our church also has a calling. Now, I read this scripture because when a ministry is birthed in the heart of God, it's always fashioned for the future. I, I think time has proven that in the ministry of Victor Eric. How many can say amen? amen? Time has proven that. That whenever a ministry begins in the heart of God, it's not that it stands the test of time alone, but that it's always fashioned for the future. Look at someone or type it on the comments and say, you have been fashioned for the future. Vision is so powerful. And what has made our ministry uh, so relevant and continuing to be strong in this day and hour is that vision gives you and I the ability to see in the dark. I heard it said one time that you can see more, visionaries can see more with their eyes closed than with their eyes open. Because when God gives you a vision, how many of you have a vision from God? When God gives you a vision, you're able to navigate and move in the dark and you're able to overcome difficult terrain. Last year, we were able to go to Yosemite National Park and uh, we camped there for a week and uh, one morning, we decided to climb Yosemite Falls. Beautiful, beautiful. There's a beautiful pond up there where the water comes down. And Pastor Miller said, let's go. And Pastor Miller loves to hike. Me, I love to chill. <laughs> I said, let's go, man. Let's, let's go. Let's, let's hike up this thing. And, you know, I was a little nervous, you know, being older. <laughs> I was a little nervous. You know, I'm not a young buck. When I was young, I used to climb Yosemite Falls with ease. But we got there a little late, and we, we were there, and the group that we went with was already up there, and we began to kind of start making our hike. And recently, I was kind of talking to Pastor Miller about some of the things that are happening. And he says, you remember the hike when we went to Yosemite Falls? He says, this season feels like that. And I remember it, because when we got to the to the place where we're gonna go up to the mountains, it's all these rocks, huge rocks that you have to kind of navigate and climb up. Some of you all remember because you were there. And he says, remember we went up, we had to step on one rock and then, you know, you're moving forward, but then, you know, you can't move forward. So you gotta step sideways and then you gotta step backward in order to take a huge leap forward. It's called navigation. And one of the keys, he said, remember when we were hiking, 
we had to make sure we had a strong footing on the rock so that we could be able to spring forward. And I began to think about that, and we got to the top. I began to think about the fact that that reminds me of the season that the entire body of Christ is in right now. Understand that we're all in this together. Whatever church you go to or whether you're part of Victor Heights San Diego, we're all in this together. And it reminded me of this time because what's happening right now is the church is trying to find its footing. We're trying to find something solid to stand on. And I believe that in this moment, this is the time where the church, the people of God, we're not just to look at the promise, but we're to look at the God of the promise. We place our foot on the God of the promise. In Isaiah chapter 45, verse 11, where I read, the Lord is actually inviting us to be curious about the future. And I want to tell you that if you're going to make it through this storm, you have to lean into the future. You've got to begin to awaken a visionary heart. You've got to begin to say to yourself that it's okay to be curious about things that are to come. Something good is about to happen. I'll say it again. Something good is about to happen. But we ask ourselves a couple questions. Number one, the question is, where do we fit in God's plan? This is an important question as we've been praying. We say, God, all these things are going on, but where do we fit? Someone say, where do I fit? We know our cause, we know our form, but what is our function? How are we to function? The church right now, you take one step forward, you take one step sideways, you take one step backward, you take one step left, and then you take a huge step forward. I had one pastor, one of my friends call me. He scheduled to open up his church. Today. He says, man, wouldn't you believe that the day, the day that we determined that we're going to have people back in the service, the governor says you can't sing. The devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. So we say, how do we function? The, the, the second thing we're asking is, what do we do in these changing times? How do we find a firm grip so that we can spring forward to the promise? God has given us a promise, hasn't he? God has given us a vision. There are some of you that need to understand that even though football games are canceled and baseball games are canceled and other things are canceled, I came to tell you, your calling is not canceled. There is still a promise for your life. I thought you'd get a little bit more happy about it online. There's still a promise for your life. Your calling is not canceled, but how do we spring? And I feel this is such an important message. Are you with me right now? Because there's two types of people in the church right now. There are those who are teetering between the old and the new. There are those who are kind of wondering, you know, are we going to go back to the way it was? Are, are things going to go back from whence we came? There's people, even leaders, who are teetering between the old and the new. They're, they're kind of waiting for the old to come back. I've talked to some people, and they're waiting for permission from the government to gather again. When the government says we can gather again, then we'll go ahead and gather again. And, I, and I, I came to tell some, some of these, well, I better be careful here, amen. <laughs> but remember during the recession, and you were telling everybody that we weren't a part of man's economy, we were a part of God's economy. And we were telling the people to give and telling them, keep that money coming in, man, because God's given us a mission, don't let the devil lie. Do you remember all that? What happened? <laughs> Now you got the money, but are you willing to call the people back in? And I just determined in my heart that I don't care how much blessing financially our church receives. I'm still called to bring you back in. Come on, somebody. 
It's your moment right now. Come on, somebody, to recognize that we are not a part of man's government. We are a part of God's government. I, I need somebody to wake up. We're not a part of man's plan. We're a part of God's plan. And how many know if you move with God, God will take care of you. If you move with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, I, I could sense that many of you understand you're a part of God's plan. Because when you came into this place this morning, you came in with a shout and a praise. You said, ain't nothing going to stop my praise. I'm going to sing a little bit louder. I'm going to shout a little bit louder. Come on, somebody. And I came to tell you, man, I keep hearing the Lord say, son, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. And if you can't see it, it's time to see it. There's only three things that we need to do in this wave of the future. Number one, all we need to do is recognize it and accept it. Number two, all we need to do is determine that we're going to be a part of it. And then number three we need to flow with the new wave of the Holy Ghost. And I came to declare to my church this morning that all things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. I came to tell my church this morning there's a new wave of the Holy Spirit. There's a new move of the power of God. It's going to look like something you've never seen before. But I came to tell you we're not finished. The church is not finished. I came to tell you the church is just getting started. The Holy Ghost is getting ready to move in ways that are unimaginable. And the Lord is saying to us, let's be a part of it. Look at someone or type it on the comments and say, let's be a part of it. You've been praying for revival, haven't you? Haven't you been praying and fasting for revival? Have you ever asked yourself this question, what does that revival look like? Does it look like the mass gatherings like in the, in the early 1900s when Amy Semple McPherson came to Balboa Park and thousands of people were gathered there and crutches were stacked and they built churches just out of that one crusade when she came and moved in the power of healing. Is that what revival is going to look like? Maybe. Does it look like filled stadiums with people? Maybe. Or is God's new wave going to look like something that God had planned all along? I came to tell you that God is not submitted to man's expectations. How many know God knows exactly what he is doing? And all we need to do is follow the Holy Ghost. Say, neighbor, follow the Holy Ghost. I've been led, in fact, in December, when heaven opened over our church, and I really began to dig my well. How many of you are still digging wells? You're still digging wells. And I really began to dig my well. And the Lord led me to the book of Acts chapter 15. And it was in the book of Acts chapter 15. In fact, if you can turn there real quick, I want to read it to you. Are you guys getting something? Are you with me? In Acts 15, it said, After they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the, at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return and rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up. Someone say, set it up. Ooh, I, I like that because we're on a Holy Ghost setup. So that the rest of mankind can seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. And then James goes on to say, known to God from eternity are all his works. In other words, God always had a plan. And as I look at Acts chapter 15, I want you to tune in here. Are you with me? As I look at Acts chapter 15, it gives us a glimpse of what the Lord had planned all the way back then. That when the apostles were in a conflict of which way they should move forward, James points them to the prophecy of Amos chapter 9, verse 11. He says, and in that day, here's my question, could this be that day? 
Could this be the day where David's tabernacle is restored? Could this be the day where the Holy Spirit and, and the power of God and as the people of God worship, that all mankind is impacted? See, if you've been praying for revival and you've been asking the Lord to move in this hour, what is the shape and form of that move? Just the other day, I received this little prophecy pamphlet given to me by one of our members. He came up to me on Wednesday. He he says, Pastor, read this. And when I read this prophecy, my heart just exploded and leaped. I said, this is what I've been looking for. Because I've been seeking the Lord for direction. I said, God, how are we going to get to the waterfall? How are we going to get to the top? And as I read this prophecy written in 1983, it talked about a new wave of the Holy Spirit. A new wave of the Holy Spirit that was coming to America. And Dick Mills, who knows who Dick Mills is? He's the one that gave us Isaiah 45, 2 and 3. He's the one that God used to give us Isaiah 54, 2 and 3. And through this prophet, this man of God, he began to mention 10 pillars to the new wave of the Holy Ghost. And as I read this prophecy, I couldn't help but to think of the moment we are in right now. I believe this prophecy gives us a small glimpse of what we are to look for in the near future, and it's going to give us the footing to go forward. It's going to be something that we can place our foot on so that we can continue to move towards the vision that God has given us in this ministry. Are you ready for this? Okay, write this down. Number one, I'm only going to share three of them, four of them. Number one, the prophecy said that the Holy Spirit will revive the local church with great power. That the Holy Spirit will revive the church with great power. There are four reasons why God will revive and empower the local church. Number one, it's because the church is connected to the needs of the neighborhood. Understand me. The reason the local church, some would say the local church, will receive revival and the leaders and the pastors and the people will be revived and that will come back to life and they will be awakened, uh, awakened is because they are the closest to the need. They are closest to the hurts and the pains of the people. We are his voice. We are his feet. We are his hands. We are his body. And the Holy Spirit is awakening the, the, the local church. Another reason that the local church will be awakened is because this is what this is what he said. You're going to your mind's going to be blown. This was in 1983. He said the world's conditions in the future will cause believers to worship close to their home residence. This is 1983. That the world's conditions in the future will cause believers to worship at home. This is heavy. The third reason he will revive the local church, he says, listen to this. Economics will dictate distance traveled. Did you know that in this moment, this day and hour, that the experts are projecting that air travel will not return to normal for 18 to 24 months? Did you know that 98% of the U.S. commercial air fleet is parked? Did you know that? And what he says here in this prophecy, that because of all these conditions, that the local church is going to be filled with fresh power. Here's the fourth reason revival is coming to the local church. He said, due to security reasons and civil unrest, Government restrictions will limit large auditorium meetings and restrict gatherings to small settings. 
Now, if you're not spiritual, you're in La La Land, you're not even hearing what I'm saying. But how many of you are hearing what I'm saying? It's amazing to me that God has chosen us to see this. That God has chosen us to experience this in this day and hour. The Holy Spirit, he's empowering the local church so that the church can be the hospital that the community and the city needs to mend society back together. And I want to tell you something that if you've been praying and you are part of the local church and you are part of Victory Outreach San Diego, I want you to get ready because there's a new unction, there's a new power, there's a new anointing coming over your life. You are his hands, you are his feet, you are his voice. The Lord is going to use you in a mighty way. There is a new energy that's about to flow. It's time to get involved in the new wave of the Holy Ghost. We've been called to meet this need. You know what I foresee? Can I tell you what, what I foresee? I said, God, what is the vision? I foresee a church full of shepherds. I foresee a church full of shepherds after God's own heart with a heart for people, with a heart for the hurting. I believe Victory Outreach San Diego is going to be full of shepherds, men and women that are being used by God. I can see groups. I can see house fires. I can see discipleship hall. I see shepherds rising up after God's own heart. In fact, I told someone the other day, I'm not going to count people anymore. I'm going to count groups. Because we're going into a season right now where God is raising up shepherds. And I don't care how old you are. I don't care how long you've been serving the Lord. God has called you to be a shepherd of his people. God has called you to lead his people to victory. God has called you to lead his people to breakthrough. Oh, man, I hope you could catch this this morning. God's anointing is falling on his shepherds, and the Lord is going to use you to set the captive free. So the first thing is not only... Is the Holy Spirit going to revive the local church? But I want you to hear this. Number two, spiritual warfare is going to come to the forefront. How many of you have been doing spiritual warfare? Let, let me tell you something about spiritual warfare. When you're involved in spiritual warfare, flabby Christians develop into strong warriors. Flabby Christians. Out of shape Christians. They're forced to fight. They're forced to pray for their marriage. They're forced to pray for their children. Do you know that we are having an explosion in our youth ministry? Do you know that the gang is exploding in our midst? Did you know that the third wave is rising up in our midst? The Lord has called you and I to spiritual warfare. The Lord has called those flabby, out of shape Christians to become strong warriors in prayer. See, as the enemy rages against the church, the, the, the saints are going to come out of the playpen and come into the trenches. That's a word for some of you online or possibly here. It's time to come out of the play plan of Christianity. This is not a game. This is not a game. Lives are on the line. Generations are on the line. And we need a church that will rise up to do spiritual warfare. We need a church that will lean into prayer. Leonard Ravenhill, the great revivalist, said, if America does not concentrate on prayer, she will pray in concentration camps. Oh, this is exciting. Ooh, hallelujah, we get to see it. Things that our forefathers spoke about. I know some of you are young, but some of you are my age, a little older than me. Oh, man. See, our preachers, they weren't doing psychology. They were preaching the word. 
Our preachers weren't just trying to get you to feel good and have goosebumps. Our preachers were preparing us for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we're strong. That's why we're strong. That's why we don't back down from the devil. That's why we don't bow down to the government. I don't care what the governor says. I don't even care what the mayor says. We bow down only to God. That's why we are strong. Because we were trained in spiritual warfare. Our preachers didn't stroke us. Our preachers didn't coddle us. Our preachers took out the knife and cut us until we became like Jesus. Warfare is here. I'm going to say it again. Warfare is here. Is the church ready to do spiritual warfare in 2020? He's shifting us from a cruise ship to a battleship. He's shifting us from carnival cruises to the USS North Carolina where revival broke out on that battleship. And I declare to you on this Sunday morning, revival is about to break out in the battleship revival. All God needs is a few people that will do spiritual warfare. All God needs is a few people that won't bow down. They'll only bow down to Jesus. Woo! Say warfare. We have the power to change things in the spiritual realm. We have the power to cancel sickness and disease. We have the power to see those who are bound come to the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the power to take the most impossible cases and watch them get lit up for the glory of God and be used by the Holy Ghost in a mighty way. I declare to you, if you would be willing to do warfare, there will be an army that God raises up in the ministry of Victory Outreach, but you got to come out of the playpen. Hey, neighbor, come out of the playpen. I'm preaching a. I'm preaching a. How many feel it's the Lord? Number three. Not only will spiritual warfare come to the forefront, but number three, there will be a new wave of the Holy Spirit and new modes of worship. Say new modes of worship. Like I told you, in December, the Lord led me to Acts 15, which is really in Amos 9-11, which says, I'm going to restore the tabernacle of David. And I felt such a hunger in my spirit for this prophetic declaration in December, and I didn't really realize that it was about to happen. <laughs> I didn't really realize that it was about to happen. You know, God's plan was always to restore the tabernacle of David. He, he, he didn't want to restore the original tabernacle of Moses. He didn't want to, with all of its originality and it being the first, he didn't want to restore Solomon's temple with all of its splendor and gold. <laughs> the Lord looked to a flimsy tent that the Bible says fell down. He looked to a flimsy tent that when David was willing to sacrifice and bring the ark into Zion, a flimsy tent that didn't give access to some but gave access to all. Come on, somebody. That's why I tell you, brothers and sisters, it's not what's happening outside the building, it's what's happening inside the building. That there's a fire in our soul to worship. That there's a fire in our people to give God glory. That there's a fire in our people to pray and to seek God. Woo! Not just on Sunday. But 24 hours a day. Seven days a week. Bible tells us that the Shekinah glory, the blue flame sat upon the ark in David's tabernacle 24 hours a day, that the bright, the, the light was so bright that the whole city could see the glory of God. 
that God always desired for a church that would not only be without walls, but he always desired a church that would never sleep. I'm so fired up about this word. I've been wanting to preach this for a long time. That God always desired a church that wouldn't just be without walls, but a church that would never sleep. Where worship and work for God would go on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We didn't know how it was going to happen. We said, what, what, what kind of church is that? Whew. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. How, how do you build a church that worships 24 hours a day, seven days a week? The, we don't know, but then all of a sudden... The Lord says, easy, you do it through the internet. Come on, somebody. You do it through the internet. You know, even the dry Christian thinkers, even the boring preachers, even the churches that don't worship and don't believe in the movement of the Holy Spirit, you know what these churches are actually saying? I was reading one study just a couple weeks ago about COVID-19. And you know what these people are actually saying? They're saying that worship will no longer just be on Sunday. That worship will be Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. These experts in church growth actually said that all the old rules no longer apply. All the old ways of doing church no longer apply. They said that Christians in this moment, and you're going to relate, in this moment want to live out their faith daily. That the times are so tough and the situation is so difficult that Christians wake up in the morning and say, Lord, I can't do it without your presence. I can't do it without your power. I can't do it without your anointing. And the only way to access your power is to pray and to worship and to hear your word. Don't tell me God didn't have a plan. Don't tell me that God doesn't know what he is doing. According to Exodus 1, 12, opposition will cause us to multiply and grow. I want you to praise God right now. Come on. Praise God right now. Should I continue? So most of us don't relish sarcasm, ridicule, and mockery. He says, yet we will face it as God's spirit is poured out on all flesh. Job 5.21 says, the Lord will hide us from the scourge of the tongue. Psalms 31.20 says, the Lord will keep us secretly in a safe place from the strife of tongues. Hollywood movies and TV will sink to new lows of moral depravity. Christians will be held in contempt while comedians make fun of the righteous. He says, at the same time, believers, this is the key. At the same time, believers will be so busy doing exploits in Jesus' name that they will be oblivious to what's going on. Christians will be so caught up in evangelizing the world, seeing the sick healed, and getting people ready for the second coming that they will be too busy to retaliate 
or even answer their critics. I want you to give God a big, big praise in this place. Come on, really praise him. There's a new wave coming. There's a new, you can play. There's a new wave coming. There's a new wave of revival. And I don't want to sugarcoat it for you. How many of you are just so sick of all these sugar-coated sermons? Just sick of it. Who wants the truth? I mean, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. In order to be a part of it, you're going to have to be willing to really stand for what you believe. And I can't think of a better people. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Than the people of Victory Outreach. I can't think of a better people. <laughs> some of you, some of us, we used to like to break the law. <laughs> Let's be honest. The sign said do this. We did the opposite just because the sign said to do it. Talk to me, somebody. I wonder that if when the Lord called Victor Outreach to reach the treasures out of darkness, that God knew exactly what he was doing. We are an end times army in the ministry of victory outreach. I'll say it again. We are an end times army in the ministry of victory outreach. And I want you to know this. All we have to do is be a part of it. You know, I've been studying on warfare, and, and the enemy has his weapons. But do you know that God has a countermeasure for every demonic force against you? He has a countermeasure. That's why he says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Come on, clap if you believe. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And he says, I'm about to do something new, but I need people that want to be a part of it. By lifting your hand, say, Lord, Pastor, I'm, I'm ready to be a part of it. Let me see. I'm ready to be a part of it. Just lift those hands and talk to them all over this place. The Holy Ghost is going to begin to fall all over you. He's raising up shepherds in the house of God. He's raising up shepherds in the house of God. Oh, He's raising up shepherds in the house of God. There's a new anointing. There's a new anointing. God is calling you to be a shepherd. <laughs> Come on, talk to him all over this place. Come on, I want to hear you pray. Oh, There's a new anointing. There's a new anointing. There's a new anointing. He's raising up shepherds for his end times army. We have the Levites, but he's raising up shepherds. He's raising up people who are not afraid to do spiritual warfare. He's raising a people that aren't afraid to do spiritual battle. Come on, leader, go, go. There's an anointing. There's an anointing. Let's sing that song. There's an anointing. anointing There's an anointing. For me. Anointing. Let it fall. For me. Let the 